Hey, Jacqueline and, and Joanna, thank you for coming in. You are just doing such wonderful work. It's amazing. It's outstanding. It's a model for everybody else. The audience has to support it. It's so compelling. And you bring such marvelous histories to the work that you're doing. So I really appreciate your coming in and sharing your insights with our audience. So good to be here. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you, Stephen. It's a pleasure. So first of all, I, I want to get your narrative. And, you know, and my audience is really diverse, by the way. There are CEOs in there and investors and board members, but they're uh, scientists and, and students. <laughs> it's, it's very broad. And what we call practitioners, people who, uh, you know, are supporting companies in some way. Typically technical, though, typically a, a highly technical audience. Uh, so they're always curious, you know, you have doing some wonderful work and they're curious about what are the inflection points, maybe two or three in your life that created this wonderful, amazing individual that you are today. And I'll start with Jacqueline first, and then I'll go to Joanna. So Jacqueline, you know, and it could be something that happened at the age of four, it could be, uh, you know, when you're 10, or it could be at college, uh, you know, what are those change makers that set you on your course? I love the question. I mean, I could go a lot of places with the question. Um, I, I think, you know, as a child, as a young person, I, I, I was constantly looking for, you know, places to help, places to contribute, you know, and I became that person in the family who is, you know, the caretaker and so on. Um, I think it was accentuated um, when my, unfortunately, when my family broke up um, and I would say that was a, 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 an inflection point from a personal standpoint that really fed um, fed a desire and contributed to what needs to be learned, right? Um, in order to transition through change in a way that is the least painful and can actually create the most value, right? I'm, I'm very much um, a student of the sort of crisis opportunity. Um, and um, and I would say the inflection points for me came mostly from, from crisis um, that allowed me to take what I felt really moved me, right, to the next level. Um, I, I would say the one of the major crises for me came in my current, my career, uh, and and was in a moment when um, a, a major private equity concern came in to invest in my company and living through the realities of what that can be like. Um, it, it really shook me. Um, I It came at a moment when I felt that I had learned a lot from the other crises that I'd been through. And um, and and it shook me how unprepared I was uh, for that experience. I learned a lot about business. I learned a lot about life. I learned a lot about what to honor, and um, and I think as as important as anything, I learned a lot about myself and the difference between knowing that the potential is there and being prepared to actually. Um, honor all aspects of it as you, uh, you know, deliver bold new outcomes, if you will. Um, so childhood, career, and I would feel, I feel that the crisis most recent is, is the one that we're all living in right now, where this combination of of war and um, economics and and supply chains and you know and all of these and drought right and the things that are really you know um, putting a very tight hug on humanity um, has been an inflection point. It's part of how Joanna and I have been able to move with such focus and determination and speed with respect to. Um, the U.S. Coalition on Sustainability and Sustain Chain. And I also think it's created the moment for the inflection point we're seeing with the technology itself, um, which has to do with 
this migration of wonderful, you know, alliances committed to sustainability and needing to level up on how fast we can get there. You know, that's really quite compelling. So uh, you experienced um, pressures, you know, you call them crisis uh, uh, throughout your life and that helped shape your uh, durability, I, I would say your resilience, uh, your passion, your commitment, and you learn something when you took an investment as well uh, to be agile and to understand even business from that standpoint. And it helps shape to where you are today too with uh, sustained chain and, and where it's going to do the future. So I can see all of these fueling uh, you and creating this wonderful uh, person who's uh, making so many different uh, transformational contributions to the world. So you know, that's a, that's a great narrative, a great story to share. So thank you for that. And now, Joanne, you know, the same question, you know, what, what were those out? And you shared some of this in New York. Right? Yeah. So, but if you could share again, uh, some of the things, you know, those elements that created who you are today. Sure. Um, so I think um, I'll probably start, I'll, I'll start with the most recent one that actually put me on this path. Um for our second time, right, with with Jackie, um, and that was about three years ago, um, which is I was just sort of going through a, a, a personal crisis pressure sort of moment where I was feeling very um, internally conflicted in terms of my career, what I was doing, and most importantly, the where I was putting my energy. Um, I was working really hard, you know, I'm still raising two young kids, um, you know, it's just, it's a lot of energy. And, and I started realizing that I wasn't in any way feeling like that energy was contributing to anything meaningful. Right. And, um, and so I, I took a big step back, um, and went through a lot of just sort of self-reflection. Right. Um, and, and, uh, realized that I, I just needed to make a very hard pivot, um, to put my energy towards something that mattered. Um, and, uh, you know, had a lot of conversations, a lot of coffees, a lot of, you know, internal, uh, dialogue and, and so forth. And then, um, was fortunate enough to actually grab a drink with Jackie and say, Jackie, I want to work on tech that matters, right? We have, I have to solve more meaningful problems, the power of technology and AI. And I've now worked at this innovation studio. Like I know what we can do. We're just, you know, I, we're not, we're not working on the right problems. And it was the exact moment, right? When Jackie had um, sort of been asked by, by Amina to take this on. And it was at that moment when she was just beginning, right. To, to sort of um, step down this, step down this path. So that was very serendipitous. I think for me, that was a um, a big a big inflection point, kind of in in my life, realizing that I I can, I can have, I I need to sort of take ownership, right, of of sort of the the, the career path and trajectory in a, in a way that that aligns much more with my inner um, values. Um, and then I think, you know, for the the second sort of, and it's not a second single inflection point, but for me, I'm growing up and I, you know, as I get older, I reflect more and more on my, on my childhood. Um, we spent a lot of time traveling. My parents were professors. And so we would take these sabbaticals and essentially every, you know, six or so years, you you're plunked down into a different school, a different culture, and you just have to adapt. And I've realized now, as I've gotten older, how incredibly valuable that was, right? As a child, when you're eight, that feels like a crisis, right? When you're in high school and you're taken away from everything that you know, it feels like a crisis. But now, as I increasingly, not only the work that we're doing with Sustain Chain, but I think the, the way the world is evolving, where we, we need to sort of collaborate more, it's more about collective action and mutualism and right, understanding each other and meeting them where they are in that culture, to me, that was a foundational learning that I had as a childhood that is um, that is really helping in the work that we're the work that we're doing today. You know, that, again, I just re sort of reflecting on what you're saying. You know, you you're uh, you've had different roles, and in your earlier roles, you were thinking uh, you're, you have this epiphany. I, I want to do something that's going to shape for good, it has some kind of uh, for all well being or some contribution element. And then reflecting back earlier in your life, you you talked about how your parents were professors and you, you know you had to adapt and that adaptability you found and that exposure to um, different kind of communities and so on 
uh, really helps you now today, right? I guess maybe more so on that diversity and inclusion side as well, right? And to respect that diversity that's out there. So, and then I can see the shared vision coming together, both of you, and you um, co-founded a company. Can you talk about that before Sustain Chain? So um, I get, so we'll start at Joanna this time and then we'll go out to uh, Jackie or Jacqueline. <laughs> Well, it was, you know, I'll let Jackie actually start it. So I was for the third hire in um, of, of Brightline and um, was an incredible journey. I was there for about nine years and was fortunate enough to help pivot the company um, to to add tech. But it was it was Jackie's um, Jackie's baby. So I'll, I'll let her uh, I'll let her share Brightline. No, I, I mean, I would say. For me, you know, I was I never intended to start a company in um, in media. I ne I never saw myself coming into the television industry. Um, and I think, you know, as I look back, Brightline is an one of a few examples of when I have basically repeated what it what it is that I do. And and the, the the most natural value I can add um, uh, to to any situate big situation, and you know, it started when I was doing um, this uh, change management with um, financial institutions, and I did that was in banking for fifteen years, and I was employee number one in a in a boutique consulting firm um, that was started founded by a former McKinsey partner. Um, and, um, I was his first hire and I, I started out as sort of that, like, you know, entry level person, hundred hour weeks consulting and over time became the president. But more importantly, we, we did these incredible, I, I always said it was extraordinary circumstances. I was in, you know, I was, I redesigned, led the redesign of 10, major corporation in in these extraordinary circumstances where um we were able to not just help the company identify what was keeping it from accomplishing its strategy we were able to help them define the path to getting there right by identifying the delta and then creating the new design and pushing it down into implementation plans and all the way through to tracking it financially overseeing implementation for a year and to me that was just like a gift from god i mean it there was painful aspects to it human impact and so on and but it really set me in this headspace of I don't want to do this for financial institutions anymore. I, 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 this can be applied anywhere. And I had the audacity to think that maybe I can contribute it to the world somehow, right? But in between um, was a very, very close friend of mine who said, I see something revolutionary going on in media. And, um, and he said, would you help me test whether or not it's real? And um, so I committed a little bit of time to him and to his passion. And long story short, Brightline, as it was founded, turned into just another clean sheet of paper design, right, that we came into the marketplace to help guide big TV advertisers to this new revolutionary place, knowing that it was going to be a long process but also knowing that there was some tremendous value to add to the folks who were going to really need to be responsive and agile when those changes did occur. That's what Joanna is referring to in terms of the pivot. And so about halfway through came the moment where, you know, the high end, you know, uh, design firm became a technology company um, that is now a sort of a standard tech inside the smart TV uh, streaming space. But that's how it was founded. It was completely unintended as many things in life are. Um, and, and was just, I think, allowed me to spread my wings and sort of prove to myself that the methodology and the approach 
actually could live in a lot of different contexts, if that makes sense. You know, you know, you you come from this uh, background, like like you indicated, in the consulting space, and um, and you have tremendous amount of success, and you're helping change making, uh, change management of companies, saving them, in other words, as well, right, and getting them back on the right strategy and so on, and all of that experience helps you when you uh, found this company called uh, Brightline, and. When you do a when you do a new company though it's there's volatility and all of that so all of the this experience would come to bear uh, from from all of this uh, change management you did with other companies right because you you would know what the pain points are and as you mentioned closing that delta but when you have a startup the deltas are everywhere <laughs> right because exactly. you because there's new territories so. Because you were at this uh, sort of very foundational level, and before I go to Joanne, I just want to do this follow-up question. You know, what what were maybe three or four key lessons that allowed you to, you know, make this startup what it is and and become a company that becomes a standard in terms of you know over over the top connected TV and smart TV advertising opportunities. I mean, I think the learnings. So many learnings, but um, um, to sort of start outside in, it, it you know one of the biggest learnings w w was that unless you can keep your eyes on the horizon, at the same time you're sort of in the micro tasks, right, and sort of map it back to the big picture. Is this you know was this is this still the path I thought we were on? That kind of check, 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 um, I believe is one of the only reasons that Brightline has actually survived. Um, we started it in 2003, back when interactive TV was something that wasn't hard to convince people that it was inevitable, especially given what was going on in the with the internet. But um, keeping people in the belief that you actually your vision was actually correct until streaming, connected TV streaming really took off, which was in the pandemic, right? So it took a, a world, a global pandemic to catalyze the television industry to finally turn the page and, and um, into this streaming world that fit individuals, humans, like in a better way than just throwing content at them on the television screen. Um, so I, there, there's there's so many things I can point to in terms of the learnings, but I would say that all I think all of the companies that started at the time we did with this same sort of view that there's going to be a lot of value here if we can sort of keep it going long enough to see it, they're gone. Um, and and I and I really believe that um, that ability that was really carved in my prior career was such a big part of why we're here today. The second big lesson I think is, is the one that I pointed to in the inflection point. Um, the learnings that came from that, from a human standpoint, from a management standpoint, um, from a humility standpoint, right? You need to have a tremendous amount of, you know, confidence and presence um, we all know, right? Um, it's, it, with a startup, in order to raise money, in order to, you know, persuade the market that your proposition is real and it's powerful. Um, part of being so shaken by the situation with private equity was remembering that you can put that presence out there, but you need to remember in every moment that it's a gift and to carry the humility and sense of, of humanity into every day. And I believe that that has also been a key contributor to being able to endure for, for as long as Brightline had to endure. And then the third thing is, I mean, I could point to so many, but relationships and the ability to honor those relationships with truth you know in in advertising 
marketing and advertising, there's, there's just a lot of things that are said and it's all part of the thing, right? Um, but there's a, a, a lack of honesty uh, uh, as well. Um, and I think that that bleeds into a lot of the relationships that get built in that industry. Certainly that's one opinion. It comes from my own, you know, sort of experience. Um, but I think that one of the things that I learned was how important it was to stick to, you know, delivering what you say you're going to deliver, speaking honestly and directly about what can and can't be done, um, honoring rela business relationships in follow through and trust. Uh, I learned that that is, is, it can mean the, the difference between life and death because so many of the folks that came at the same time we started out were not that, you know, that they didn't build the relationships in that way. They were built off of, we're making you money. And because we're making you money, we have a relationship. Whereas we came at it as we are building a relationship and we're building it because we think that there's a big opportunity for us, but we're willing to build and show and deliver and follow through. And I think that a big learning came in just how rare that is in the industry and how much it can set you apart. You know, I, I, when I hear your story, then what I'm hearing underlying this, this kind of respect for the other um, listening, active listening and understanding the other, you know, uh, journey and their point of view, and then looking for common ground and then co-creating together. So that's the trust in the relationship and that's more enduring and that builds resilience and, and it builds commitment and it, and, and it, um, this enduring quality um, as you weather the storms, right? Because anytime you have a company, there's going yeah. to be volatility. So, so those are you know those are great lessons. Now, Joanna, you mentioned that you were the, what the third hire. So, t t tell me your journey as coming in as the third hire, and and why did you join? I think you were number, number two, Joanna. You was were I number two. two? Oh, I was number two. You were uh, the third, including me, but you're number two hire. <laughs> Right. Um, oh my gosh, what a journey. Uh, so many lessons as well. All I know is clearly I went back for more <laughs> <laughs> after working with Jackie for about nine years. Um, so um, let's see. I mean, it, yeah, it was a, it was a tremendous, tremendous learning experience. I think from, from my, you know, I completely echo everything that Jackie said and when, and it's, it's actually just, it's beautiful to hear it, right? Because it's, it's been a while, but even just hearing the way that you're describing it, I'm, I'm remembering the, the rooms, the conversations and, and whatnot. It, we, we went through a lot, right? Um, together in those years. Um, but for me, one of the, one of the biggest lessons was sort of stick with itness. Um, I mean, to Jackie's point, um, you know, this vision, uh, she, they, they were early, right? Brightline was early. Uh, to the market, but there was that conviction, there was that belief, um, and there was just basic, right? What you tell kids, stick with it, right? Um, yes, you know, you you got to keep putting your feelers out into the market, and you got to be flexible, and you have to adapt. But there's just something to be said for you know, just you know, keep, keeping on. Um, which for me is a, an important lesson that I'm always reminded of. I'm I'm um, an entrepreneur by spirit, so I I get excited by new shiny objects, right? And I love starting things. Um, but, you know, for something to really scale and succeed, you, you just kind of have to keep working it. You have to keep working it. Um, and then a, a big lesson for me came at the moment when we were pivoting to sort of add, add tech, right? And I realized, A, I wasn't going to be the one to be able to play the kind, you know, participate and contribute in the way that I had been able to up until that stage, right, of, of the, the, the journey of the company, because we needed a different kind of leadership. Um, so it was both, you know, what I think the, the organization needed, right, that I cared so deeply about. And it was also a big personal learning to say, well, if this is where the organization is headed and, and you know, technology in general, right, has this incredible power and I don't understand it deeply enough, this is a signal for me personally to go and get really good at it. Right. And then that was the moment where I uh, I left to go run a software innovation studio and did my own sort of five year boot camp. Um, 
but those were kind of the the, the big learnings for me in, in that journey. Okay, so on, let's unpack what you're saying there, Joanne. I mean, you enter the company, so you're the number two hire. It's yeah. number three after Jackie uh, founded this company. And and you go through this process. And it's interesting, you know, you and Jackie's mentioned this uh, previously, this sort of private equity. I want to mind that a little bit more because it seemed to be a kind, kind of an awakening moment. And, and you talk about resilience. And, and so it reminds me of Angela Duckworth and this idea of grit, right? It, it, mm-hmm. And I'm going to sort of abstract what she talks about, maybe add a little bit more, but, you know, where you have some talent and you work really hard, and you develop skill, and then you take that skill, work really hard, and you get some achievements, but that's not enough. Then you have to combine achievements with perseverance and dedication and commitment and 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 being agile and optimism and that ultimately leads success so you have to have that resilience aspect of just keeping at it and i see all of that in and both of uh, your journeys and then you realize that you got to do this tech element right and so you start you start a a software studio i mean that's just incredible oh i didn't start it i didn't start it i joined it as the managing director the beauty is that it was fully baked an incredible organization of engineers and you know product managers and experienced designers and data scientists what they actually needed was more the glue um and so i helped run but frankly also learn from the existing the existing team okay so you you, you go into the software studio and th- and this would appeal to my computer science colleagues out there and engineering colleagues out there um what so before we go back to this journey of, of, of Brightline and then we'll finish that and then move to sustain chain, but you enter in and and how do you how do you how do you immerse yourself with people who uh, are in a entirely different world, right? Because you know I come from a tech background, so and often there's this divide between tech and business or, or tech and marketing and. How, how, how did you bring those pieces together? How did you immerse yourself sufficiently that you could corral <laughs> these kind of diver- uh, d- these uh, diverse forces together to unify and, and and gain that expertise? And then you can bring that back into uh, Brightline. So. Do you want uh, me to, to jump in or, oh, Joanna, I'm sorry. And you're asking specifically about that, that software innovation it, studio, right? That I left. Yeah. So, um, in in hindsight, the the CEO that brought me in uh, took a big risk, right, in bringing me on. And and um, uh, but you know, I had zero experience, right? Zero experience in technology. Obviously, that's why I'm I'm going. I have experience in business and startup and innovation, right? Um, but it turns out that it was a you know, it, it, and the and the um, the organization Innovation Studio still exists. It's called Originate, and they specialize in. Um, you know, NLP, AI, sort of more sophisticated MVPs and V1s. And they either work with um, uh, large enterprise organizations, helping them kind of set up their innovation studio, or they work with high growth startups for their kind of first phase, right, before they're able to kind of build their own team. And they're an incredible organization. But um, in those days, what you know, the CEO uh, had done was essentially pulled together some of the most brilliant young engineers, you know, we're talking 10 Xers, right, just really smart, creative technologists. And they were all working together in the studio. They're all brilliant. They're all having a lot of fun. They're all having 20% projects. They're hacking, they're doing their stuff. There was no way to bring that to market, right? There was no way to say, hey, hey, Vanguard, do you want to work with this bunch? Hey, BlackRock, right? Don't you kind of don't you want to work with these smart engineers over here? So actually, they didn't need somebody that understood engineering. They needed somebody that would get to know them, their skill set, help them sort of productize that, if you will, and help be that translation layer, right? Because you know the BlackRock organization, for example, they wanted that young energy and that skill set and that experience to kind of infuse the culture, right? As they were going on their own agile human centered design journey, right? Um, and obviously, you know, as an organization, you know to retain and maintain that caliber of talent, right? You need really high profile projects and work. So I kind of ended up just being that, you know, helping to facilitate that that middle layer, um, if you will. And and I'll just say how, a lot of it is back to Jackie's point around humility, right? I came in being very clear that I have no experience in this space, but I'm 
incredibly committed to learning, right, and understanding. Um, and I had engineers literally like teach me how to like, you know, commit my first line of code and so forth. And it was fun for them as well to feel like, hey, right, um, you know, you're you're going to help us sort of bring this experience right uh, to market. Right. And then you're able to bring that back into Brightline, right? And that experience, because Brightline is now shifting into really a tech tech forward company. So uh, Jackie, you, you wanted to add to this narrative here that uh, Joanna was sharing. So go ahead. I was just going to say how wonderful it was for you to speak to the the chasm or chasm that is there between tech and business and so on. Um, and um, it, it was one of the th the most valuable things that I walked away from my first career at, at Aston with is this experience with that experience in watching, you know, when you, when you do a design, you identify the Delta and you do the design, you have to surround it in terms of implementation with all of the requirements. Right. And, um, and that certainly was driven, especially in banks by what we used to be called systems and operations, right. Which is, is now technology and operations. Um, right. And, um, and often, decisions on which scenario and whether to move hinged on, you know, the, the cost of capital it was going to take and the execution risk attached to changes in systems and operations. You know, financial institutions had so many legacy costs, right? Legacy costs in their, um, in their operational and technology backbone. And so a lot of time was spent. And so I was able to observe a lot of what you were referring to, which is, well, this is what you asked for. Well, no, actually I wanted this. Well, you said you wanted this and this is what we delivered. And now you're saying you want something else. No, I'm not saying I want something else. I actually said what I wanted the first time. It's just that you didn't deliver it. There is, there is this, you know, they miss each other a lot. And, um, I think it was one of the things that for sure I was able to bring into the equation with Brightline, but what's interesting is that it's one of the things that is really, I think, contributing to these, you know, the, the, the sort of cadence of, of dialogue that's going on around sustainability and, and this place that, um, that Sustain Chain is sitting where business just needs to understand with a lot more clarity you know, what it's going to take to rebuild these supply chains on a global basis in terms of what the UN is telling it it needs from them. There is this chasm between what they're being asked to do and the way they execute on a day to day basis. And so it's, it's, it's a it's the parallels are everywhere to what you just asked about. And that's why I was smiling. So. Uh, you know, we we uh, spent some time on on Brightline, and you know, definitely the first company to pioneer interactive television uh, solution for brands. And you went through this sort of journey of, of implementing advanced te uh, technology suite. You know, you've got a plug plug and play solution to do this entire scaling of over the top uh, connected TV and smart TV advertising opportunities, and so on. And and you were able to bring different uh, skill sets into this uh, shared uh, uh, journey, this journey that you initially founded, Jacqueline, or, or Jackie. If you, um, and then, Joanne, you were able to add to that. And you you formed a partnership, in essence, right? Um, you two, because you continued into this idea called sustained change. So can you describe the, the catalyst for that idea uh, and then the initial... Uh, steps in that idea, and and I guess we'll start with you, Jackie. I mean, how did that come together initially? I would have. I was only in a position to be asked to do um, uh, what we were asked to do because of something that came immediately prior, and that was when I was asked to oversee the second. Um, uh, the second stage of the Millennium Villages project. So Jeffrey Sachs um, 
back during the Millennium Development Goals timeframe, um, was had written a book called The End of Poverty. And what struck me about that was always with Jeff and, and he, you know, you can love him and you can hate him, but he's a brilliant man. Uh, one of the remarkable things about him is when he writes as an economist, as a macroeconomist, he has this ability to not only, you know, crystallize the problems in a multi-dimension in their in the multi-dimensional quality that they have. He then has the ability to convert that into, and therefore, this is what has to happen, uh, and, and in this way. And in reading that book and spending all the time I was spending with financial institutions, effectively doing exactly what he was describing, top down, bottom up, end to end, holistic, you know, all of the things that characterize good change management outcomes. Um, I just couldn't, you know, get enough of, you know, wanting to being curious about how it was going, where the problems were, what was being learned, how are they adjusting and so on, because it was basically doing what I was doing before and taking it to this world stage where, you know, I've, I've been looking for that opportunity to sort of contribute on, on that in that way for a long time. Long story short, it gets to a point where a trust is developed um, between Jeff and his people and me not looking for a career in the, in what they were doing, you know, not looking to make a name of, of, you know, for myself, just genuinely wanting to learn and see and help. So he shocks me one day in Senegal and says, I need you to be chairman of the board of millennium promise, which is, you know, the, the arm, the financial arm of millennium villages project. And um, and I said no, and well, I said no until I said yes because there was no saying no. Um, and what that led to was five years of education um, across the famine built of Africa, with this you know applying a methodology that I was very familiar with across ten countries. Um, what did it look like? bottom up, top down when you are applying this, what were the things that stood out? And um, and what happened very soon after the Millennium Development Goals transitioned into the Sustainable Development Goals, um, one of the big uh, benefactors in the Millennium Villages project came to me and said, you get this in terms of you know what's missing from the implementation approaches that are out there, the sort of academic, scientific, we know it has to be locally, you know, embraced and so on, but there's, it's missing a lot of things. And um, could you please put your, you know, your vision to work? And could you please do it with, you know, the private sector, because it's one of the gaping holes in all of this at the end of the millennium development goals, um, one thing was certainly agreed by no matter where you, no matter who you spoke to, um, and that was the role of business uh, and and you know and and global global um, industry to be the solve on all of it. It had to come from there uh, in order for it to scale big enough um, and affect massive impact across these countries. So in combination with the experience that came from the Millennium Villages Project, this gentleman uh, and his family who asked me to do this, his daughter, and Amina Muhammad. So we touched on Amina a little bit earlier and Amina Muhammad, as we all know, is a UN Deputy Secretary General extraordinaire. She's amazing. Uh, and she was in the trench. I was in the trench with her and had the honor of you know of walking side by side through the Millennium Villages project time frame, and we became sisters. And when she went into uh, the UN at about the same time that I was being asked to do these things, um, I sat down with her and I said, "What do you think?" And she said, "You have to do it." And you know, similar kind of wave of panic swept over me as when Jeff said, you have to do this. But I did feel a little bit more equipped 
and um and felt very sort of it appealed to me a great deal um but I was a person who tended to take, I tend to take on a lot. You take, you take on so much more than me. You make me feel so good. <laughs> you make me feel so good for everything. You wonderful things that you do. But the, but the bottom line was that because of, you know, the people that I came to know and who came to know my way of thinking, and I guess the ener- type of energy that I was bringing to these things, I was in a position to take the clean sheet of paper out and start to look for the delta between what business was being asked to do and the imperatives around business unlocking what it was going to take to get to sustainability, right? And the way businesses operate and the way industries run um, and the way change must, you know, take place in order for these big, big kind of systems-based changes uh, to occur. And that was where sustain chain came in, you know, there's no way to get there as fast or as smart or as seamlessly, holistically, right, as needs to be than to fully leverage the technology capabilities of the internet and um, machine learning and and AI to, to do so. And the germ I mean, technology was never, it was never a question that it was going to have to be a technology, all right? Um, given the size, the quantum and the speed with which a solution would have to be discovered and applied. So, so I, I'm hearing this, uh, really, it's a decades long journey, right? Because the Millennium Development Goals yes. came out in 2020 to 2015. And then was superseded by the uh, Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. So you're talking a decades-long journey of yes. discovery and and uh, really looking at a fundamental level of of sustainability around the world, and particularly in Africa. And you're you're part of that. You're part of that change. You're part of that transformation. And and you come to this realization that this is sustained chain is a solution to bring together some of the key elements and so on. Now I'm going to move to uh, Joanna. When did you get involved? And can you condense down sustain chain into a 25 second elevator pitch? She can. I know she can. I can. (laughs) I got got involved about about three years ago. and it was, you know, Jackie had the vision and, and you've heard all the sort of everything that's the, the methodology was there, right? It was a question of how do we actually bring all of this experience, right? And this uh, this sort of method to bear, um, but for the sustainability ecosystem, right? And for this much bigger problem. Um, so, you know, it started with, uh, you know, clean sheet of paper and we started literally sketching out the first, you know, prototype of what sustain chain would look like. Um, and uh, we have been on this wild journey ever since. What is sustained chain? Um, to Jackie's point, right, the big problem is it's incredibly fragmented, the ecosystem. We know that we need holistic systems-based change. Um, we know that we need sort of hyper-relevant connectivity, right, across the players of this ecosystem. That does not exist. Sustain chain is purpose-built to be a community platform for sustainability leaders and change makers where they can come and they can dynamically real time exchange solutions needs leads learnings best practices think of it as a sort of knowledge sharing platform for the sustainability community and ecosystem no, no single entity can sort of go it alone anymore right they're they're making these big bold commitments um and then they're turning around to their team and they're saying, great, you know, we got five years or 10 years to get this done. How do we get it done? Where do we start? Right. Um, and we we all know, right, that no organization can actually figure all of that out alone. There's all these solutions to implement. And you're going to have to forge new partnerships and you're going to have to incubate new tech and so forth. You need to sort of be able to rely on uh, on on the ecosystem, right, on the sustainability community. Um, and this is the safe, trusted, vetted, neutral platform that enables that kind of dialogue. 
And, and, uh, you know, how do you differentiate against, you know, using other tools like uh, WhatsApp or some other kind of community uh, sharing and chat tools that are out there or, uh, you know, like a LinkedIn is a connection mechanism where people can form communities and work on common problems. How, how do you differentiate against these other uh, platforms that are out there? Um, two primary ways. Uh, one is, um, actually maybe there's three. Um, one is that this is for, purpose built by and for the sustainability community, right? Unlike all of the other big players out there, right? And, and, and ours is powered by machine learning, but our algorithms, right, are actually guided by, right, helping this community, right, achieve their desired outcomes. So it is, you know, it is about a concentration, right, and a, and a, and a vetted exclusive community for, right, for sustainability change makers and leaders. That's number one. Um, number two is that it is, um, it is vetted, it is vetted for those individuals that are really doing the work. Um, and number three is it's about action. And I, I speak with folks every day that are actually either on WhatsApp or they're on Slack, right? And they're actually coming over and they're looking to use Sustain Chain as well. This isn't an and or, right? But what many of these coalitions and alliances are finding is that certain tools out there are really good for conversation, right? Lots of chat or really good for networking, but they're not great for action. Right, they're not great for sort of understanding the signal to the noise, um, and so sustain chain is much more about action. Right, guide me towards the groups that are talking about the things that I care about. Guide me towards the solutions based on what I've said that I'm focused on. Right, we we need a shortcut, um, and so it's it's much more about action versus kind of noise and chat. So I'm just going to ask one more question to you, Joanna, and then I'll go back to Jackie, and, and that is. Uh, you talked about AI machine learning that's integral to the platform. Uh, it, what does it do? It, is it a matchmaker? Is it trying to help uh, address that signal to noise ratio so you get more intimate connection occurring guided by yes. the AI machine learning? Yes. I mean, what you, it, it, it's exactly that. It's about It's a guidance system. Right, it's powered by reinforcement learning, so it's live. We actually deployed it at the UN General Assembly, which was a great moment for us. Um, and so now, every day, as the community grows and as um, members interact and take action, it is going to get smarter. Ultimately, it is guiding members towards the actions of greatest relevance um, based on their particular goals and objectives. Okay, so Jackie, I can see the realization of your vision, right? And and this conversations that you've had over decades, and then now you're seeing the realization. And what I'm hearing is you've got a minimal viable product, which is this, you got an actual deployable solution out there. And so who are some of the partners that you're engaging in? And how did you engage these partners to say, you know what, we want to support this uh, endeavor, and we want to accelerate it, we want to uh, help with the relationship building. We want to bring our communities into that. Who who are these partners that are validating that, you know what, this is something that everybody should be involved with? Right. Well, I have to say that when I think of the most important partners that we have, um, I, I have to start with a gentleman called Will Kennedy, <laughs> wow. um, who very early on, because yeah, he no. was asked to do so, listened to what we were about and what we were trying to accomplish. This was three years ago. And he is, I think, you know, it, it's sort of like the six, what is it called? The seven degrees, six degrees of six separation. He is our guy. I mean, uh -huh. we could look to just about any, any important partnership we have somehow probably leads back to <laughs> Yes. And and that comes from the blessing of of Amina, right? Um, but and the blessing of Will, because you know he really just grabbed on, and it sounds like you know Will, and you know how he can be. Um, right. And we are just so so blessed to have him in our equation, you know, from almost day one of really you know designing it out and getting underway. Um, I would say the second most important in terms of execution is um, is is ThoughtWorks, who have been our tech partner 
for the last three years and who, because of the relationship that Joanna had um, with, uh, with that company, took us, you know, opened the door, listened to our story, were inspired and um, made us a green tech investment for them. If it weren't for them, we would not have been able to, you know, build sustain chain itself and certainly not da Vinci, the, the AI machine mm -hmm. learning layer. Um, and so we are forever um, indebted to, to ThoughtWorks. Um, the types of partnerships that are critical to us now are, are the partners that, um, and so many in between, by the way, um, mm -hmm. but, but the ones that are critical to us now are the ones that represent the exponential adoption that is taking place uh, right now. Um, Sustain Chain was launched last year at UN General Assembly. We have a little over 1,300 members on it. But in the last six months, and again, I, I touch back to something I said very early in the conversation, the big picture issues that we are living in right now, um, I, I feel have created a certain sense of desperation almost among the people who are most committed to sustainability. Um, how are we going to keep the SDGs on track? How are we going to maintain focus when so many other things require our attention um, just to sort of, you know, save save us, right? Like, you know, whether it's big economics, war, so, and so on, it just felt overwhelming. And so over the last six months, what we found is that Sustain Chain was at a point in its development and awareness that big partner alliances have come over to say, we have to move, we have to move quickly, not just for our organization, but as part of these entire alliances, we wanna operationalize, and we need to do it fast. Can we do it? And so UN General Assembly this year was about launching um, um, Da Vinci, but it was also about sharing a moment of hope because of the traction, this different manifestation of adoption was occurring, right? And in my mind, it's the network, of, it, it is our network effect that is starting to take hold. Um, and those those partnerships are, are you know, us, Joanna, to share the names of the ones that, sh that she's, you know, comfortable sharing and knows that are okay to share. But but there are about 17 of them that like sort of are all serendipitously coming together in this last six months to operationalize Sustain Chain. Do you want to mention a, a, a few, Joanna? Yeah, um, sure. I mean, just to mention a few, there's, um, you know, there's uh, Stimson's uh, Alliance for a Climate Resilient Earth, right? 120 plus organizations, many of them engineering firms now collaborating, right, on, on resilience and, and infrastructure. Um, there's the Design for Freedom, entire movement focused on eradicating modern slavery, right, across the supply chain. Um, there's the Global Fashion Agenda, right? Incredible organization convening the entire fashion industry, innovators and brands and so forth to do more and collaborate. Um, and I'll just mention one more big one, I think maybe the third, right, Jackie, in terms of um, Will and then ThoughtWorks and then XPRIZE also is um, uh, recently joined um, and is an incredible partner for us. And we're really excited for the unlock because as we're starting to um, get this, you know, sort of network effect, this demand, right, to sort of plug in and leverage sustain chain for, you know, alliances and coalitions, XPRIZE is going to be helping us create the you know API right open API and single sign on capability so that you can still operate wherever you are right it's actually just more about creating you know more connectivity and relevance right across across the community so let me and so uh, many partnerships we need by the way <laughs> so many more so many more so um, to both Jackie and Joanna then make sure that you. Uh, sent to Av, the uh, chief editor for these interview series, some of these links, and so that we can include them um, in the bio part of the interview, which will be released soon, right? So this chat. So let me summarize what I'm hearing then. Uh, you know, Jack, you mentioned Will Kennedy. Will Kennedy's been at the UN since the 1990s, and he's the head of partnerships there, and he knows everybody. <laughs> 
including in the UN and outside of the UN, right? Because that's his job. His job is to bring all these people together and he's the ultimate connector. And you talk about Mina, you know, the deputy director and, and, uh, and uh, or a, a deputy secretary general, I think, right? Something like that. So, and yeah. again, highly connected, can bring that community, a lot of trust. And then you need the tech element. So you have ThoughtWorks come in and they're providing all of this tech expertise, including you mentioned the DaVinci uh, AI uh, capability. And last year, the UN General Assembly you released. And then again, you're just adding more. And then you've got acceleration occurring because you've got these communities coming in and saying, you know what? We believe in this thing. Uh, we believe in this platform, which is really empowering those who have purposeful leadership, uh, purposeful business and capital coming together and identifying in a trusted way ways they can uh, work together to accelerate working on impact, uh, working on things that uh, that environmental soundness or uh, or any of the big challenges that are SCG based and so on. So that that's what I'm hearing. I can definitely see synergies with the Knowledge Impact Network and and uh, Elaine, who's the uh, CEO, and, and Alan, who's the one of the founders, because that's a community of, of thought leaders who come together and say, you know what, there's something with impact, and let's let's uh, focus on, you know, how can we bring those people together to work on in this shared community of knowledge sharing to accelerate uh, projects that can scale globally and so on, or even regional projects. Are you are you working with them as well? The Absolutely. knowledge impact. Yeah, Elaine was at our event and um, Alain and Elaine have been, you know, fantastic partners um, and they they're also they're they're on the platform as well. Right. And then so what's the model? What's the business model? So, you know, the whole thing now in terms of impact businesses, right, or social enterprises is that you don't want them continually having to receive grants hopefully, right? So they can sustain, sustain chain can't sustain itself at some point. So is there a business model to allow that self-sustaining? So you initially you have grants and you have investment, but then it can sustain itself. And what's that vision for that continu continuity of the platform? So Jackie, yeah. it's your original vision. So how is this going to manifest? Yeah. I mean, when I, when I started to design the solution, um, and to sort of put it in the context of, you know, just how quickly um, it needed to uh, get traction and momentum. I thought about, you know, what are the points of friction and how are we going to neutralize the points of friction to see if we can make people move faster, you know, get that acceleration that you're describing. And I would say there's a few things that, um, contribute to con contribute, continue to contribute to our ability to do that and also inform the timeline for the business model. Um, so before I get to the business model, let me just say that, you know, it's the fact that it's neutral, the fact that there is not a big one big or two big companies who are behind it. Um, uh, it, it is, you know, the fact that it's free, at the moment, um, it means that companies don't have to think about it in the context of budget cycles and how does it, you know, how does it stand up next to other things like it that they've thought about and so on. You know, what we've tried to do is create a path of least resistance for everyone to come in. So right now it's free. In terms of the business model, it is, um, and we're just starting to kind of dip our toe in and start to move into this place. We know it's not advertising because one of the things that we need to preserve in terms of trust is our commitment to making this an invitation only vetted community where greenwashing is not a factor. Um, and, um, and certainly advertising conjures up coming from advertising it conjures up you know this um this question mark right of yeah but mm, you know that type of thing so we know it's not advertising um that said uh there is a value a direct value that every member receives from sustained shame 
And so it starts with suge a suggested donation, right? Grassroots, we suggest, you know, here, like a, think of it as a, a museum suggested donation is, right? Um, and ask people to be uh, honest in what they can contribute in, in making that contribution. That's the way it will begin. Um, we do have a white label capability for sustained chain. It was it was built in a way that the 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 way that it is um, it works in the in the sort of multi dimensional way that it works can be applied um, to other mm -hmm. uh, missions that are addressing fragmentation and lack of integration and holistic right um, appro approaches that are are required to succeed. So we hope that um, white labeling uh, will be a part of that as well. Um, and lastly, we also know that or even though this is a nonprofit because I come from the business world and you can sort of think end to end if all of this works out, what else is happening besides people collaborating and finding investments and finding solutions and so on are actual transactions, right? The actual transactions that occur. So if right now, sustain chain is more like a, you know, a LinkedIn social media platform. Um, it must, at some point, there must be an Amazon type platform, right? For um, for this, you know, trusted group of people to transact together. And um, we know that that is something that needs to be created. Um, we, we have, I have, you know, a, a clear sense, as clear as I could be right now, as to what, what that needs to be. And when it does come, it will be uh, basically utilizing key data elements of sustain chain, right? So if you're two members who, you know, feel like they're they want to move forward and there's some commercial aspect to what they're talking about, there will be a, you know, a a, a private secure bridge for them to take that conversation into a commercial realm and go into this other platform. And that platform will, and you, you opt into, you know, bringing the data with you and you understand that you're, you're not no longer in sustain chain and so on. And then that platform is, is licensing the tech, it, uh, the data it takes to complete that transaction. So, there's you can see that there's like multiple points at which the value can convert from receiving to giving uh, or receiving to compensation and that's the way we're thinking about it right now i see so um so i i, I have a, a series of questions here and uh, so what, what i'm hearing is it's it's free and uh, but you have a donation model, like Wikipedia has a donation model, right? They solicit right. periodically and say, you know what, you, you love our service. Why don't you donate to keep this thing going? And then uh, you have the ability that if you want premium capability, uh, a premium capability to transact in some way, that could be maybe subscription-based or it could be transaction-based, yeah. but some kind of a revenue model as well to help sustain this platform. So I, I can understand that. I mean, I, I belong to LinkedIn and I actually uh, purchased their sales navigator because it gives me additional capability. Yeah. I have the premium edition, <laughs> gives me other capabilities. And, and so I'm willing to pay for those uh, additional features. So, so I can see this uh, being a sustainable business model as well. Uh, but then I have a question, you know, let's say I, I'm out here in the wilderness and I think, wow, what a wonderful idea. What's the onboarding process? How do I get into this trusted community? What is there a form I fill out or something like that? And you do some checking. I mean, what's the process for somebody who wants to, who's interested in getting involved? And it can be individuals or does it have to be a community or both? Either. And I'll let Joanna speak to the onboarding process. Yeah, it can be either. So um philosophically think of it as you know the the community is growing the community so right now it is invite only 
Um, we're inviting, you know, members that we know are credible that we've either reached out to because they're doing incredible work and they're vetted or they've been recommended to us. Um, but then once you're a member of the community, you're able to invite other peers and members, right? Um, so you can either join as an individual in that way, or you can join as an entire community and coalition. So right now, as Jackie mentioned, in terms of the white labeling, we're being very careful with which alliances and coalitions, right, we're bringing on, because when we bring them on, they're bringing on their entire community, right? And so we're trusting their vetting, right, and verification process uh, in, in doing so. Um, and then the onboarding is 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 quite simple. I mean, it's, you know, create a, a profile um, of, of yourself, uh, uh, connect to LinkedIn. We're not looking to recreate your LinkedIn profile, right? People can go find more information there. Um, create a profile and, um, you know, there's certain data attributes. What industry are you focused on and what are your core challenges um, and what role do you play in the community? This helps the machine learning engine then make, you know, more curated and relevant recommendations. Um, so it's a little bit about what do you care about in sustainability, right? So that we can guide you towards the right, you know, partners, peers, solutions, and so forth. You know, I do a lot of keynotes. And uh, so this is kind of brainstorming. I'd love to put a little bit of a demo into my keynotes or what, what that experience looks like. Sure. So he, he, here, here's an opportunity or maybe a challenge or maybe both. And you give me a 90 second, your genuine voice, where you speak at the very beginning and say, "Hey, Steve, it's a, it's a pleasure to talk to your audience," and you and you do a, a twenty five second sort of a, a very quick overview of what your uh, what the capability is and what the roots are, and then a demo of what that experience is like and that recommendation engine. What does that feel like? I mean, does it feel like LinkedIn? You know, like. LinkedIn, I'm just bombarded with recommendations of people I should connect with and things like that. So it's it's mining that and saying, hey, this is something you may be interested in or some, you know, so if you're willing to uh, put that together, then I'll embed it in my keynotes because I think what you're producing is, uh, you know, definitely really interesting and something that people should be supporting because it's for the benefit of all, right? <laughs> Thank um, you. So, we, even have, we may even have that for you right now. So yeah. <laughs> we, we may have we may have what you need already. So we'll definitely send it over. OK, Thank so you. you send it over. I've got a keynote coming up. I'll embed it. Um, but because my keynotes cover so much territory, you got to try to keep it to, let's say, 90 seconds to under two minutes yeah. anyways. Right. So yeah. and I can even give you a <laughs> QR me. code. Um, <laughs> One thing a lot of, I'll just quickly say that a lot of our alliances and coalitions and partners are increasingly realizing that this is a great vehicle for extending um, the dialogue post an event. So events, right. you know, incredible people in a room, everyone's very inspired and there's great speakers and so forth. But then most people leave thinking, well, now what? I wanted to meet more people or I wanted to connect or we talked about this great thing, but what's the actual solution? Where do I go to find it? And so we built it in a way where um, actually there was a great organization called Converge on Climate that just had an event last week with folks from the sort of tech sector and academic and so forth. And so they're going to be using it to say, great, after this event, here's a QR code, join our group on Sustain Chain so you can keep it going. Exchange, right? Form little, you know, projects, incubate new things, right? Go off and do more, you know, take more action together. Okay, so um, definitely then I'll try to accelerate this or I shouldn't use the word try because then it's too soft. I will accelerate this uh, <laughs> in the different uh, communities that I'm part of and make sure that they are aware that it's there, right? So I can see all of these use cases um, that would be a win-win. Um, one of my friends calls it an omni win, right? Where well, you win, but they win as well. So, yes. and Love it's that. when you have yeah, that shared great. winning that that's sure. when you get this acceleration. Okay, you know, we, we've been talking together now for well over an hour. So I'm just <laughs> gonna ask one more question. And and this is to both of you. Um, so I'll start with you, Jackie. Uh, you know, what are your final recommendations to the audience? And then Joanne, your final closing thoughts. Hmm. Um, well, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, from the standpoint of recommendation, I will just share um, a suggestion, um, yeah. which is that um, if you feel, if you are dedicated to 
making change in an area of sustainability, ESG, and so on, that feels opaque, or you feel limited, or there are just so many roadblocks and so many considerations and such blind spots and so on. Um, and you feel like the sort of the challenges and realities are just so daunting. And yet, you still have the desire and you still want to, you know, try and drive through that and figure out how to make a change happen, then we're speaking to you and sustain chain was built for you. Um, and not only are we trying to solve for visibility, seeing across the field, you know, giving you new ways to think about how to tackle or, or really, um, or um, solve for a roadblock. Um, we also know that this is gonna have to be a, uh, a completely um, lateral and systems-based undertaking. Um, and I will say one more thing before I completely close, which is there's one aspect of this whole equation that is absolutely critical and the, uh, machine learning engine was specifically built for, which is we can guide you on things that we know are relevant to you. You can connect and do things together, but to what end? What's the so what, right? And it is the analytics and the ability to create mission control, right? For systems-based change in a global supply chains that is missing from this equation. And only when you have a technology like this can in, in a community that grows in massive ways, can we all get to a point where we can step back and say, ah, here's where the Delta lies, right? Here's where the big gaps are. And we can start guiding people toward those gaps and, and go through a process of actually chipping away at all the things that stop us from safeguarding the future. And if you're one of the people who uh, what I'm saying really speaks to, please reach out to me, reach out to Joanna. But most importantly, get on to sustain chain. <laughs> you know, uh, before I go to Joanna and the closing comments, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, please provide links to the different partners and so on, but also include a description of sustain chain and the underlying tech as well. And all of the thinking that has occurred from the technology enablement standpoint and how it's empowering and driving this because it's tech for good, uh, because um, that'll build a broader community where I can get this interview into. So make sure that that's part of your submission. And Ab will have this completed probably out by Monday. So if you can get it um, later today, it'd be great. And uh, so we can get this out. Okay, now to Joanna, your, your, your closing comments. Um, so I'll sort of say something similar to Jackie, but in, in a, I guess maybe a different way, which is just that um, there's a role for, if you care, there's a role for everyone to participate right across the stain chain. So whether you need help, right, you can become a member. If you're an engineer, right, we're, you know, we're gonna become, you know, trusted source and open source, come and contribute, right? This is a public utility for good. Um, if you're, you know, the head of an organization and you have, um, you know, uh, excess capacity, right? And and bench, right? And can contribute uh, development, you know, resources and capability, do so. Um, there is literally a role for everyone. This is designed by and for the sustainability community. So if you care, right? And you're sort of inspired by what we're doing, um, it's going to take all of us. There is a role for you. To Jackie's point, reach out and we are very creative. <laughs> we will find a, we will find a, a way uh, for sure. Yeah, it, it sort of uh, reminds me of this uh, group who are producing the Translucia Metaverse and the MQDC Metaverse and this kind of for all aspect that uh, message in there you're putting out. So you're doing the same for all, right? And the benefit of all, for the benefit of all well-being. So 
I, you know, I, I thank you both for coming in and just sharing so many of your insights, your history, your narrative, your stories, your your struggles as well, because there's so many lessons in all of that. I guess we didn't get time to unpack the private equity part. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We can save that for a different day. <laughs> <laughs> We need I mean, a, whole, a whole a whole session on that. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean that would be a really interesting story onto itself. But anyways, <laughs> thank you so much for coming in and sharing so much with our audience. Thank you thank so you. much for having us, Stephen. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Video Cast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.